welcome to our first show of Teaching Mathematics. We're very excited to be starting this initiative. We're joined by Dylan behind the computer and Robin. Say hi, hi. Robin. Hi. Thanks, Helen. Now, before we continue, Robin, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Well, I'm formerly a mathematics teacher and right now I'm lecturing at WITS and I'm busy lecturing to B.Ed students who are studying to become mathematics teachers. Okay. Now, why do you know so much about our topic at hand? Well, I've just finished my master's thesis and the topic of it was learning functions and especially functions in equation form. And of course, our show for today is about grade 10 algebraic functions, which include which ones? Well, it's the linear function, yes. the quadratic function, which looks like either a smiley face or a sad face, our exponential function, and the hyperbola. Fantastic. Now, before we get too much into everything, remember that you can sign in to chat with us and join the conversation. Dylan will be watching the chat screen, so if you have any comments that are relevant, please uh, send them through. <laughs> yes. We're looking forward to having some interaction with you. Yes, of course. Well, let's begin with first grade, which is grade 11. 11. Well, the grade 11 um, technical difficulty that was meant to say grade 11 I see yes what have the grade 11s just finished so the grade 11s would have just finished analytical geometry okay and the next thing that they'll be moving on to is advanced algebraic functions okay let's just be clear quickly here we're talking about the the schedule set out by the CAPS document correct yes. so if you are following the CAPS document at the end of last term you would have finished Analytical, analytical geometry, 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 correct. Okay. And at the beginning of this term, you would have started with algebraic functions. Which means they started yesterday. I hope so. Yes, <laughs> it's a big times. Yeah. Okay, and what are they moving on to after this? Afterwards, they'll be going, they'll be carrying on with functions, but they'll be doing trig functions. So okay. um, sine, cos, and tan graphs. Okay, so they do almost lead on to each other. They do, yes. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit more about grade 11 algebraic functions. What are they learning in grade 11 that's different from grade 10? Well, in grade 10, um, they just learned the basics of each of the functions. Grade 11, there's just a few more aspects to this. So it will be um, uh, horizontal shifts okay. instead of just vertical shifts. And there'll be a lot more applications such as um, finding the distances between points, finding coordinates of intersections, finding um, maximum lengths in between two functions as well. Sure. So it starts to get a bit complicated. Now, when would you do the maximum length between, if, if we were in a classroom now, would you start with that maximum length? Definitely not. That would be one of the last things that um, we learn, as it's uh, kind of uh, the most it's difficult, difficult application. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. I would think it would be more like a, a level four type question. Absolutely. Which is yeah. out of their comfort zone, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. yeah. It, are there any things that you, in your experience with teaching grade 11, is there anything that you found that they struggle with more? Well, I think that because um, exponential graphs and hyper hyperbolas are introduced kind of very close to the end, um, they tend to be the things that are struggled with the, the most. And also the um, when there's more than one graph yes. on, a, on a set of axes. Now it's it's quite it interesting. tends to get very confusing. Yes, it's interesting that you say, uh, you cite that exponential and hyperbolic functions are introduced towards the end. Maybe we could make it better by introducing them a little sooner. What would you think? I, I don't necessarily think so, because um, in grade 9, learners are still just starting to grasp it. Um, uh, counting points. Let me correct and, and myself there. I mean, um, you mean within, within grade eleven? Grade eleven, the section there. Well, I, I don't know. I I find hyperboles and um, exponential functions very hard. Um, learners do struggle with them, not because they haven't been introduced earlier, but because they are quite difficult to grasp. Okay. And even though they have been introduced in grade ten, um, yes. they tend to get quite complicated in grade eleven. With, um, various different shifts, the horizontal yes. and vertical shifts, and then on top of, um, on a set of axes with many different yes. um, functions, it, it gets confusing, but it's not uh, insurmountable. Yes, 
And of course we know that in grade 12 they then do the inverse of these functions. Yes. So it's quite important yeah. that they master it. Yeah. Right yeah, then. and and I, I I don't necessarily think that um, I mean I I do think that in grade ten it's okay to have just a procedural yes. understanding of of those two functions, and it, that will develop over time. I don't think it's um, necessary to have an object conception of now, those functions. Now, by procedural, you mean that they follow a routine to solve each one. They're Correct, not yeah. really applying themselves further. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And 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 just being able to plot it point by point. Okay, so in grade 11, we're looking for more of an intuitive understanding of what's happening yeah, as well as maybe it. integrating it with other parts of mathematics, so it's not just functions, it's yes. just expand. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, let's move on to what's happening in grade 12. All right. Yes. Okay, unfortunately, that section, we had a wonderful thing that popped up that said grade 12, but it's not working now. That's let's okay. <laughs> yes. Grade 12. What so have they, they just finished? They should have just finished, according to the caps pace setter, trig and specifically trig are with compound angles, compound okay. and double angles. Okay. And what are they on at the moment? They should have just started um, trig as well, but now looking at 2D and 3D trig problems. Oh, it's one of my favorites. Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about applying real world word problems or real world problems to it and I find yes. with the, the 2D trig you don't get to explore it as much as the 3D trig. 3D trig you can really give proper examples. Yeah, yeah. I saw this other one with uh, security cameras and the distance they could see and that relates oh, that's fantastic. to yes. their world. Especially in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, and what are they moving on to after this? They should be moving on to polynomial graphs next, which is a very short section okay. um, in the CAPS pay set. It's towards over one week. Okay, that is mm -hmm. quite short. It is very short. Yes. Now, common pitfalls in 2D and 3D trick? Well, I find that um, learners often have problems with understanding the 3D diagrams because uh, obviously you're your problem is presented on in 2D on a yes. flat piece of paper and the diagram tries to show the 3D situation. So it's very difficult to understand how this diagram actually looks in real life. So yes. I, I often see that um, something which is uh, perpendicular to the ground, for example a flagpole, yes. um, is drawn in a way that it doesn't look it doesn't always look like it's standing up straight. Yes. And the right angle between the, gr the ground and the flagpole doesn't always look like a right angle. It's, yes. a, um, it's drawn a little bit funny. So I think the, the biggest um, thing to remember when teaching it's 3D interpreting is, is those interpreting diagrams. those graphs and, and almost being able to visualize the diagram in real yes. life as to, to what's happening. Well, maybe it would be worthwhile then taking a little trip outside your classroom and with some string and setting up a 3D diagram and getting mm. the students to, or the learners, to then draw their own versions of the 3D diagrams and then compare them. It's, it's an excellent it's idea. I'm full of them. <laughs> okay, well, shall we continue to the grade 10, the focus of our show? Let's do it. Okay, well, in grade 10, what have we just finished? Um, grade 10, we've just finished, I'm not really too sure. Oh. I'm sorry, well, <laughs> I didn't look at that. I think it was algebraic functions, or is that what that's no, what we're that's starting what we're now. currently on yes. now. So let's move on to what do we need with this subject and uh, with this particular section, algebraic functions. What skills do we need from previous grades as well as previous sections? So the skills that would be needed um, from grade eight and grade nine, first and foremost, would be understanding the Cartesian plane and how points are plotted, um, x and y values are okay. pl plotted on a Cartesian plane. And um, that the function is essentially a relationship between the between x and y, okay. between two variables. Okay. So the Cartesian plane is that cross? It is. It's yes. drawn on the board here. So it will be all our y values are plotted on our vertical axis and all our x values are plotted on the horizontal axis. Okay, and obviously when they're drawn more professionally, they'll be at right angles to each other and drawn with the with a ruler. Yes. Yes, okay. And then where are the positive and where are the negative? 
So all our x values over here will be positive, and okay. our x values over here will be negative, and our y values going up are positive, and our y values going down here are negative. Yeah. This Cartesian plane comes into play a lot with grade 10 content. It comes into play with trigonometry and things like that. Analytical geometry oh, as well. Yes, so if they don't get the, the Cartesian plane in grade 9, it's really important that they master it. Mm. However, there's always a problem of time, and do we really have time in grade 10 to reteach the Cartesian plane? Not really, but I, th I think that um, you, you can just go over the basics, in that if you, um, if you, if you plot a coordinate, coordinates are always plotted with our x value first and our y value second, and that, for example, a point over here would be positive x value, and a positive y value. Okay. A point over here, for example, would be a positive x value and a negative y value. And okay. I, I don't think it's um, I don't think it's something that, that's particularly difficult to teach. Yes. But if it isn't set down as a foundation right in the beginning, it will it will give you problems. Yes. But it isn't necessarily something that we should be spending hours on within the algebraic function. Definitely not. No. No. Uh, what I've always told classes in previous years is that you always go inside the house before you go up the stairs so your x value is always across and then your y value is up or it's down. All right that's, that's a that's an excellent way of remembering it. Yes and hopefully it means that you don't have to spend hours revising it within the grade 10 classroom. I always remember it that um, x and y are consecutive in the alphabet we always go x y z so yes. that's why we do x first and we do y second and x is like a short man and he goes sideways and Y has this very long tall yes. part over here and, and that's why um, we use that as the vertical. Yes. So there's always um, some way of helping you remember. Very much so. And mm -hmm. it would be quite easy to see if someone didn't understand the Cartesian plane. Right. So yeah. it, yes, if you did see that you could point them in the direction of some online resources that they could then watch or mm -hmm whatever or maybe hand them a grade 9 textbook that they could go through okay so what else do we need to know before we start algebraic functions not us the learners well I think that um, in in the first term of grade 10 there's um, often um, we work on algebraic expressions and that's the correct way of um, multiplying and uh, yes variables and adding variables we can uh, only add like terms and um, factorization factorization also is also very good very working young. with exponents yes so it, it's good that um, that's done in the first term because it also sets down a foundation of working with algebraic expressions yes. and m most of the time I suppose if you get given an, uh, a function in standard form yes. it doesn't really matter but there are times where you get given functions that and they're not in standard form yes. and you have to either find the subject of the equation or just play around a bit. Generally those it. types of questions would happen towards the end of the section. Yes, wouldn't it? correct. Yeah. Now in the interim it might be a good idea to it might be a good idea to give them practice sheets for homework to practice those skills. Also to keep them brushed up on how to do factorization and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what sometimes happens in the classroom is that students think well algebraic expression starts and ends here and then I'm going to start something completely different over here mm -hmm. and, and there's no continuation or, yes. or learners think that there's no continuation between subjects but actually there is yes and it's important as a maths mm -hmm. teacher to constantly emphasize that you need to know this to do this mm -hmm. we need the whole of maths to do the whole of maths correct um, yes okay and uh, now where does this lead to? The section of algebraic functions, do, what, what can it be used in in real life? You know, you always get those questions in class. There's some smart kid who's sitting in the corner, and by smart, I'm using it sarcastically, <laughs> who sits there and says, well, I'll never need this in real life. Why must I do this? So what can a teacher say to that person? Well, often children, if they don't go into mathematical fields, they're a little bit right, so I think that um, mostly 
algebraic functions teach, teaches you rigorousness, yes. and which you can expand to all other areas. But if you are looking in, in real life, it's um, functions can often help you predict real life situations, such as the growth of bacteria, yes. if you're going to be going into the medical field, and that's often um, predicted by a, um, an exponential function. Okay. Um, the growth of population as well is also predicted by an ex so exponential function. You could tell them that um, if you're a life science student and you're wanting to carry on in this kind of field, functions would be useful for you. Exactly. And if you're geography, population, once again, population mm -hmm. it can be applied mm -hmm. there. Exactly. Yes. And um, functions are also uh, used to predict or model physical forces. So if you're okay. going to become an engineer, yes. then that's a then it's a very important um, part of engineering. Yes, it is mm. very much so. Okay, well let's move on to the actual content of the section. We've discussed what we need to know before we start. Where it well actually we haven't discussed what the assessment is for it. How is the section weight, weighted, not wasted, <laughs> <laughs> weighted right in exam. final exams? Well, in the final end of your exams, yes. um, the section on functions counts for 30 marks yes. out of a total of 100, which is in it's paper one. It's quite a high percentage. So it is. And um, that's, that translates to 30 marks out of 200 because our second paper is also out of um, 100 marks. But um, the important thing to note is that um, in paper two, you also have a section on analytical geometry. Yes. And that's worth 15 marks out of 100. And um, many of our uh, fun linear functions yes. actually cross over to analytical geometry. And so when you are learning functions, you le you're not only studying for the functions part, but you can it does also help a little bit with analytical so geometry. It's, it's almost mm. twenty percent of your end of year grade ten exam. Correct. Yes, so it's very it large. It's, it's one of the largest sections. Mm. And we know that because we've spoken about grade eleven and grade twelve functions already, then mm -hmm. being the inverse functions we've yes. discussed, we know that this continues all the way to grade twelve. It does. It does indeed. Yes. Yeah. We could use it then to motivate the students in our class. So sure. That this is. This important. is it, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. You can get marks and you can do this. Yeah. Okay, now let's move on to the actual content. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the two, well, it's, it kind of blurs into each other. We can talk about content and we can talk about skills. And content is going to be the things that, um, that we need to know off by heart and then skills would be... How to deal yes, with these. Yes, exactly. So let's start mm -hmm. with the content. You mentioned that there are four algebraic functions. There are indeed, and in grade 10, we look at mainly just A and Q as the two um, okay. Hold on a second. characteristics a of a function. A and Q fit in where? Um, well, if you bring up the slide of the, four, of the parent graphs of the four functions, we have um, Y equals AX plus Q. This is for a linear graph. Okay. We have y equals ax squared plus q, and this is for a quadratic. Yes, this is being the <laughs> There you go. And we have y equals a over x yes. plus q, and this is for a hyperbola. And we have y equals a times b all to the power of x plus q, and this is for an exponential. So in grade 10, um, well by the time we get to grade 11, there are some other characteristics such as um, horizontal shift, but for grade 10 we're just looking at our a's okay. and our q's. Okay. Do the a's do the same thing not to every function? Not necessarily. Okay. It's, I suppose it does it can be seen as something similar, but it's not exactly the same. In our linear function, A will tell us how steep our gradient is. Yes. And if, depending on whether A is positive or negative, it also tells us whether it's going uphill or downhill, so positive okay. or, or negative. Okay. And then A in our quadratic um, function tells us kind of how skinny and how fat okay. our, um, our smile becomes. Yes. And it also, whether it's positive or negative, tells us whether, whether it's a happy face smile or a sad face smile. And what's nice about that is if it's negative, it's unhappy, which 
it matches. Yes. It would be terrible if it didn't. <laughs> so. Indeed. Yes. And then in our hyperbola A tells us um, kind of also how fat and how thin um, the, the two arms of yes. our graph are. Uh, kind of how far away from the origin. Okay, I see what gets. you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then then, so what you're saying is that it'll either be really, really close there or... Or really, really fat. Okay. So the, the bigger A is the further away from the axis it goes. Okay, and also positive and negative, how does that affect? Positive and negative will say whether it's in the first or third quadrants. Yes. Or the second and the fourth quadrants. Okay. And then our A value and our exponential graph will also tell us how s how steeply or gently the the curve. So curves. a lot of the the A's are about the shape of the graph. Correct. Yes. And mm. they may not affect it in the same way, but they do affect the shape in every case. Indeed. Yes. Okay. So A A R A is affecting shapes. Okay. Whereas Q in each and every single case will tell us about vertical shift. So whether it's shifting up okay. the whole graph or down the whole graph. Yes. So it doesn't actually affect the shape, it affects where it sits on the okay. graph. Okay. Is it as simple as saying if it's plus two, it's going up two? If it's minus two, it's going down it two? It is as simple as that, Okay. Yes. However, I must point out a misconception here. Yes. Um, many learners in grade nine learn that Q is the y-intercept. Okay. Which, at grade 9 level and at a linear graph, isn't necessarily wrong, but it can cause further misconceptions, for example, when we get down to hyperbolas and exponential graphs. Yes. Because it's not necessarily the y-intercept, it's the shift. Yes. And, and so hyperbola will have a different y-intercept, but it will have an asymptote going through Q. this Q value. Yes. So, so teachers just need to be careful not to confuse Q with only being the y-intercept, rather say that Q can show the y-intercept yes. in a linear graph, but it actually shows, it, it actually refers to the vertical It's a, a whole shift in thinking, mm. where you talk about the Q being the shift rather than the y-intercept. Yes, because yes. In, in linear and quadratic graphs, you can simply just say it's the, it's the intercept. But, but then it but gets it changes. It gets a little bit more when you introduce the asymptotes. Yes. Okay, there is one thing I've noticed over here, and that is our x is different in every equation or formula. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about this. Well, over here, our, our x is um, it's almost a one to one relationship with y, which is why it's a straight line. So our linear graph will usually have the shape just. Of, yes. a shape of a straight line. Of course it has the exponent of one as well. It does. Yes. It does. Whereas um, in our quadratic graph, because x is being squared, it's suddenly becoming positive in, in our, in our yes. negative values of y and our positive values of y. Which That's is why it has a shape of that. It, it, um, it becomes positive over here, which is what we expected. But it also becomes positive in our ne in our um, negative values because it's squared. Okay, and the hyperbola where x is a fraction. Now it also has two asymptotes, which is why we've got two different lines. Mm -hmm. Tell us about all of that now. Well, first of all, we're going to have an asymptote, and I'm just talking about the parent graph over here. We're going to have an asymptote along our X that our x axis and our y axis, um, because when we divide, where, when x is zero, you uh, obviously our graph doesn't exist. Tell us why. Well, anything divided by zero becomes undefined. Yes. And you can obviously, um, there is no value when something is divided by zero, mm -hmm. so it becomes undefined, and that's why we have an asymptote or a dotted line. And often uh, the learners forget about that rule. Once again, it's now mm -hmm. rules of fractions that you have to apply to functions, and they they don't want to cross that divide. Yes. So it's, it's important yes. to bring that in. So it's it, it is indeed. So our graph will look something like this. Um, and over here, when we have a negative, yes, 
uh, when we divide by negative, our answer will be negative, and when we divide by positive, our answer will be positive, which is why they're on two opposite sides. Does that make sense? Or you mean when x is a negative value? When x is a negative value, when y, will be a positive. y will become negative okay. because, uh, well, anything divided by a positive divided by a negative becomes negative, and positive divided by positive will become positive. And that is why our um, our a value will dictate actually if whether sorry, do you mind if I have the oh, of pen? course, please. Um, where a is negative, well, positive. Uh, a negative divided by a positive becomes yes. negative and when a is negative and x is negative over here a negative divided by a negative becomes a positive and as you can see our result in the y values is positive okay. so that's why we switch quadrants when um, when a is negative okay okay now a little earlier you talked about procedural knowledge and then in grade 11 we're going into more intuitive understanding. Mm -hmm. What would be the procedural way to teach what you just explained? So to start to start off, um, and this is actually one of my points on, on how to teach this section, I would start very much, well, not so much with the linear function because grade 10s should have experience with the linear function, yes. but at least with these three graphs, I would start it very procedurally by saying, here is your equation y equals let's say for example x squared plus 2 and I would first get learners to um, ge generate coordinates yes. and you could do that using a table yes, or whatever table method is correct um, so we have our x's and our y's if our input is 1 if our input is 0 our y will be 2 if our input is 1 it will be 3 if our input is 2 so on, and yes. we get uh, we get coordinates, and we use these coordinates to plot points onto a graph, and actually join the dots, and okay. and see if we can make a graph. Uh, and the reason I would do this first of all is that um, it's very important to under for learners to understand how the equation yes. generates a certain shape of graph. Okay. And that when we have a square, we'll, almo we'll always have um, a shape like that. Okay. When we have a fraction, we will always have something like that. So okay. it's important for, for learners to understand what sort of, um, what sort of shapes yes. each, each function or each equation generates. I'm going to introduce another color here because mm -hmm. we touched on a really important thing. And that is the position of the x, what it's doing within it, yes. tells us what kind of shape it's going to have. Correct, yeah. And often as teachers, we can neglect to tell learners to watch out for the position mm. of mm. x. Okay. Yes, learners really need to be very comfortable with um, the standard form of each type of, yes. of um, graph and what that, what graph each of those generates. Now, you know what would be a fun activity, and I'm thinking off the top of my head, is to, it does sound a bit childish, but we all know that grade 10s are big people, uh, little people stuck in big people's bodies, <laughs> uh, but make a whole lot of flashcards with different formulas for different mm -hmm. functions on them, mm -hmm. and get them to identify them, not to draw them or anything, just to say, this will be quadratic, that will be uh, exponential, or even a matching flashcards uh, exercise where you have a shape of a graph and a standard form of, yes. of, an, of an equation on a function. It could evolve and match into that together. really nicely. Mm -hmm. so you could do group work with that, get them to bounce ideas off each other. And I think that's a really important thing to teach them how to identify what they're drawing. As soon as they've got the idea of what they're plotting, mm -hmm. they can start looking at coordinates and things like that. The other important um, aspect when it comes to knowing what equations um, need what is when you get given a graph and yes. you get asked to find the function. Because, for example, if I get given a graph like that, it's quite clearly um, to us an exponential function. But if learners are confused and they suddenly start using a, yes. a, 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 a hyperbola, mistake. 
um, yes. in trying to find the equation for this graph, then they're not going to they're not going to be able to do it. Yes. Now we haven't actually spoken about the exponential function that much, so let's move on to it, seeing as you've drawn the picture. Well, an exponential function um, is a function which lies very close to either the um, x-axis or some sort of asymptote, and shoots up very quickly. And I don't think I've I've drawn this very nicely, so let me try again. It's it's very close to the x axis over here, and then it increases very quickly. Yes. And this this type of graph, I think, is one which is most often used in real life situations to model um, population growth, bacteria growth, yes. that sort of thing. Yes, especially mm -hmm. lately with our population increasing to over seven million. Yes. In such a short time period. Seven billion. Seven the world. billion. Thank you very much for that correction. Uh, yeah. the, oh, I was going somewhere. I forgot. Carry on. With so the exp the exponential graph over here. Let me make a little bit of space. The exponential graph over here has um, a few aspects. It's got a and b and q. A um, often tells us well if it's positive or negative. Right, it will be okay. um, positive yes. and negative. And so that's purely defined by the direction it's travelling from left to right. Yes. Okay. And then um, with, a, with the, the additional thing that we're in, in exponential functions is whether b is um, over 1, greater than 1, yes. or less than 1 if it's a fraction. Okay. So if it's, if it's greater than 1, well, it will be the same as these two graphs that I've drawn here. Yes. But if it's smaller than one, for example, if it's a fraction, it will do something like that. Now, why one? What is the magic behind the number one? Well, anything less than one is a fraction. And, yes. for example, if B is a fraction, it actually reverses everything because a fraction can also be written with a negative exponent. Uh, so we're back to exponential laws. Then. Ex exactly. Okay. So we can... That we then need to make sure that learners have learned about exponential laws yes. and um, how to deal with negative exponents okay. and, and that sort Why of thing. Why can't B equal 1? Well, if B is equal to 1, anything uh, to the 1 to the power of any number is 1. So if B is equal to, if B is equal to 1, we're just going to have a flat line because it will be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Yes. One, one to the power of one is one. One to the power of ten is one. One to the power of okay. hundred is one. Which exactly. is a linear function. We're back up here, isn't it? Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good news. So uh, now asymptotes. We have spoken about them, but they are quite difficult to understand. We've said that the hyperbola mm -hmm. has two asymptotes, a and vertical. the exponential has one. Yes. How would you explain it to your class? Well, an asymptote is a place where your graph doesn't exist. Okay. And um, so very clearly our vertical asymptote over here, it's quite clear because x is zero. Yes. But um, for our two horizontal asymptotes, it's a little bit more difficult to understand. Okay. And, um, Basically, we have to find a place where the graph doesn't exist anymore. Okay, and how would we do that? Well, our, our vertical asymptotes in, in both cases of our hyperbola and our exponential function are actually our Q values. Yes. Where, or our, our vertical shift. Okay. Okay, so then we go into the conversation about Q values and shifting and all sorts of yes. things like that. But we have covered that, so... Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, do you have any colourful explanations that you would use? Uh, okay, let's put ourselves in a scenario. We've got a class who aren't quite grasping this abstract concept because it is, it is abstract. It's difficult to apply it to an everyday situation when you're drawing it for the first time. So what kind of tricks or what kind of stories would you tell them to try and explain things? Mm, I'm not. I'm not too sure. What okay. <laughs> what do you What do you mean? Well, do you want an example? Yes. It, let's say going back to exponential. How would you 
explain the exponential function if they're not quite grasping it? I, I think I would go back to the beginning and ask them to plot it out again and again and again. Okay. Um, just to see. So if I had y equals 2 to the power of x. Yes. Now, what has happened to the a and the b there? Well, 2 would be the b. Okay. And because we don't have any value over here, we could just say that a is equal to 1. Right? Okay. We, we're looking at the, the most basic form of the function. Okay. And it's also good to remember that if we have, for example, y equals negative 2 to the power of x, it's like saying negative 1 times 2 to the power of x. Yes. Okay. So you would get them to plot these mm. over and over. A and a very um, useful tool or, or method of teaching is by using variation. So I would get learners to plot y is equal to 2 to the x. Yes. Y equals 3 to the x. Y equals 4 to the x. What do these values tell us? And that's what you would ask them. And, and, and this is what I would ask learners. And then I'd say, okay, well, compare um, 2 to the power of x to y equals negative 2 to the power of x. Compare that to y equals negative 3 to the power of x. Compare that to y is equal to negative 4 to the power of x. So then learners see the difference between a positive graph and a negative graph. We can then um, vary um, our Q values. So, we so you're basically changing one thing at a time. I am. And mm -hmm. I'm assuming with varying the Q values, you're going to make it all y is equal to 2 to the power of x plus or minus something to Correct. change You it. can say y is equal to 2 to the x. Vary that with y equals 2 to the x plus 1. y equals 2 to the x okay. plus 2. And here we va vary our Q values to see what effect that has on, on the graph. Okay. Okay, so now we're in class and we've gone through all of these variation plotting and we're getting a grasp of what each one of these things are looking like. Where do we go once we've mastered the basics? Well, um, in grade 10, essentially you get asked just a few types of questions. Um, and I'll, I'll write them down for you. Um, the first type of question that's very common is just plot the graph. Okay. What kind of level are you looking at uh, now? This would this would be at um, probably a level one or level two question. It's not very difficult. You can do okay. this um, uh, very procedurally in that all you need to do is plot a table of or generate a table of values. Yes. Get your coordinates and then plot the graph. Okay. So that that would be at, at this would at be a the level. easy question. Yes. Okay. Yes. Then the second type of question that we get is um, find the equation. Okay. And that's when you've got the, the picture of a function or a graph. Yes. You've got the picture of the graph and you need to find the equation of it. Mm. Okay. Generally, you get given, um, you'll get given a graph, you'll get give, given a picture of a graph, um, and you'll have at least two pieces of information. And some of the, some of the pieces of information are implicit okay so you Explain don't realize what implicit so means. so this um you'd get given a point um you get given a point here and because it's drawn through the origin yes. you need to you you yourself will need to understand that that is can be zero zero all okay. right or for example if you get given um a hyperbola and it looks something like that and you get given one point, you will probably think, oh, I don't have enough information. Yes. But because they are drawn right up against the axes, you then will need to realize, okay, so my asymptote here is at y equals zero. Yes. So some of the pieces of information, they are there, but they're a little bit hidden. Yes. You just have to take the time to find out where they are. Now, would it be worthwhile in class to write notes about these kinds of questions, like if if the hyperbola, if the asymptotes are at zero, then Q is equals to zero. 
would you would you have done those kinds of maths in class? Oh yes, I think that is something that would have been taught already. Okay. Mm. And what kind of things would you include in those notes? I mean, we haven't spoken about domain and range yet. Would those be included? No, we haven't. But um, those definitely should be included um, within within the notes of each each type of function. Okay. Okay, let's seeing as we're on it very quickly before we move on to the next type of question. Domain, what is it? Um, the do domain is um, is um, all your x values. Okay. Am I am correct here? Yes, you are. And then our range will be looking at all of our y values. Okay, the reason I know you're right is because the... <laughs> G looks a little bit like a Y. That's and that's, that's my I trick too. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I always make sure that my range goes with my Y values, and because domain doesn't have any tails, as we used to call them. Yes. Um, that's the same as X. Okay. Now, X values, Y values, they they're a little bit abstract. Apply it quickly to this parabola. So if we look at this um, parabola over here, to find our domain, we want to see where where do the x values exist? Okay, the and x values of the graph. Yes, we want okay. to see where the graph exists in our x values. Yes. And because we're looking at all our x values, we, we want to see does it stretch to infinity, um, positive infinity and ne negative infinity for my okay. x values. And even though we've drawn it up until here, bec because we know that it carries on forever, we can say that x is an element of a real number. Okay. So it exists actually for all x values. Okay. Y, however, is a little bit different because as we can see, um, it will carry on forever to positive infinity, but it, our graph never actually goes below the level of zero. Yes. So we can say, therefore, that y is greater than, greater than or equal to zero. Okay, and it's equal to zero because it does actually touch, touch zero. Point. Yes. Okay. And there are many different types of notation that you can write it in. Yes. Some people prefer intervals, some people prefer whatever. Yes. So that's that's up to up to per per personal preference. But uh, learners should learn all of yes. them. Yes. Yes. The thing to watch out for yes. for domain and range is in exponential graphs and in in hyper hyperboles. Yes. Um, there are places where x doesn't exist. For example, and those would be the asymptotes. If we have just our regular, um, sorry, that must be straight. If yes. we have our parent graph for a hyperbola, there is a point over here where we can where x doesn't exist because okay. obviously you cannot divide by zero. Yes. So therefore, you would say, well, x is an element of real numbers, but x cannot equal zero. Okay. So you just have to be careful with that. Yeah. Okay, now let's go back to these types of questions. Plot the graph, find the equation, and the third type of question? Then you get um, a whole a variety of application questions. Yes. Um, for example, um, the intersection. And that would be two... That would be... Two graphs. Two graphs. Okay. There's also questions which are finding distances. Okay. And that would be the level four that we spoke about earlier. Correct. Okay. Now. And there's a whole lot of other variations on, on these. Yeah, in general, I call them application type questions yeah. where you use your knowledge to apply. And those are generally level three and four questions. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, all of these would be in your final exam. Yes. Absolutely. And the thing to remember in your final exam, or if you are setting an exam, you should set um, a good, uh, good variety of questions. Yes. Not too many easy questions. Not too many difficult questions. Um, and the Department of Education has set out, has specified how to weight your levels, how to, yeah, how how to, to weight, weight your sections. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's quite important. Now you have put together a slide that has um, three, uh, three points of struggle. Unfortunately, we're not able to show it. So can you quickly, these would be the three main pressure points. Quickly read through them for us. So we've gone through a little bit of this already, but um, my first very important pressure point would be that learners absolutely need to know which type of graph is um, indicated by which type of function. Okay. 
So, um, and, and the, the upshot of that is that um, there are far too many learners who confuse one type of graph yes. with, with the, a, the wrong kind of equation. So my, and then the second pressure point relates to the first one, in that they need to be very sure on, on what um, A and Q does. Yes. Right? So our characteristics of A and our characteristics of okay. Q, um, and this starts to lead to a more holistic understanding of our function. Okay. And your third pressure point? And the third pressure point, um, we did speak about this, but this relates especially to Q, and in some graphs, some graphs, um, it's used to show what the y-intercept is, and in some graphs, it's used to show the asymptote. And so we need to be careful with that. And okay. That rather, we see that CQ as being a shift, the shift instead of the, the intercept. Okay, mm. uh, we will put these up, we'll list the link to the video so that people can read through them. Now, you've uh, touched on quite a bit here. I know you've also put together a, a selection of links, and we're going to cross over to um, the computer quickly where we can look at the links. Uh, now you've chosen everything maths. What is everything maths? I have indeed chosen everything maths. It's a fantastic online textbook which yes. has been developed by um, fantastic people in Cape Town. It so it is Capsuline? It is Capsuline. Okay. Um, it was the Shuttleworth Foundation that started the initiative. And they've got sections on algebraic functions. They do, they do. They have um, they have a section on each of the types in of. Real world. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, or they start off with a great, great introduction on functions in the real world and yes. how how it can relate to the real world, and then they have sections on each of the types of. Now I functions. see they've got interval notation. Ah yes, they do also. Things. They do also start off with with the great introduction on on notations. Yes. And. Um, now, um, I Repres do know different representations of functions because obviously we know that we can represent functions in many different ways yes. as an equation, as a table, as a flow diagram, and as a graph. And it's it's good to be able to convey to your learners that a function is a relationship, yes. which can be represented in many different ways. Okay. Mm. Oh, good. Now, uh, before we, we are coming to the end of our time, so before we sign off, I thought I would take the viewers quickly through how to access our YouTube channel. That would be great. Yes, we've got masses of material available on our YouTube channel, and the easiest way to get to it is to type the address into the address bar of the channel, which is youtube.com forward slash mindset learn. Then you will be taken straight there, and if you scroll down, you'll see that we've got the Learn Extra Live 2014, then we've got mathematics and physical sciences, and it goes on and on. So if you are a mathematics teacher, which all of our viewers should be, you would click on mathematics. Then you would find our different playlists. Now, each one of those thumbnails that are there has a playlist attached to it. So you're not just playing one video when you go into that. You're going into a whole set of resources that are there. And I have found three videos that we're going to quickly show. This one over here is a lesson, uh, and it's on functions. And we've got someone teaching to the camera, and it shows from the basics, the very basics of functions, all the way up to how to apply them in a question. Then we've got two Learn Extra Live lessons, and these are lessons that are done live with participation from Twitter and Facebook. So the learners are participating in it. However, they are th these lessons are obviously pre-recorded now. They're not live at the time that you're showing it. Each one of these videos are roughly an hour long. So, uh, and you can find segmented versions sometimes. The third one, uh, is functions two also a learn extra live video so you could show the first one and then the second one a few weeks later now the reason I think these are so valuable is if you have someone who is really not getting it if you are able to give them the link to one of these videos they can go home they can do it in their own time and they can get through it's a great remediation tool for yes. people learners who aren't up to scratch very much so okay now we need to end off, and that means it's time for one last thing. 
which is meant to be almost a motivational teaching type strategy. And I've taken the one last thing from a book called Teach Like a Champion. Oh, that's one of my favorite books. Yes, it does have a lot of practical steps. What I like about it is it's all actionable. You can start immediately tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So this, um, this particular step that we're going to be talking about is called opt out. No opt out, not opt out. <laughs> and basically, it says that whenever a student is asked a question, they must give an answer. And preferably, it must be the right answer. And they have various strategies to then do that. And there's no, absolutely no option of a learner saying, I can't do it, or yes. I don't want to do it, or I'm too shy. They are not allowed to opt out. Yes. So a good strategy to do this would be, let's say you are Joe Soap, and I say, Joe, uh, what is the equation of a linear function? And you say, I don't know. I will then turn to Sally over there, and I will say, Sally, what is the equation of a linear function? She will give it. I'll go back to Joe, you, mm -hmm. and I'll get you to respond. Now, it sounds a bit silly at first, but the message you're sending across is that the student has to participate. They don't have an option here. And, and also, it keeps them on their toes then because they know they can be asked a question at any point, and no one wants to look like a fool. It's also great to get the whole class participating. Yes, very much so. Another strategy is to rephrase your question. So rather than saying, uh, what's the equation of a linear function, say, what is a linear function? And then they can say it's a straight line. And then you s scaffold them yes, into, into exactly. giving you the answer that you wanted. Fantastic. Mm. That is it. OK. And with that, we have come to the end of our first live show. It's been Thank you, great Heather. fun. Thank you That's to Dylan good. for controlling the back end. Please join us again soon. Cheers. Bye.